much and thank you all for coming out. What a wonderful evening. It's really, really a pleasure and it gives me a lot of encouragement to, to see filming. such enthusiasm because uh, the issues are so, so, so vital, so important. And I am so encouraged to know that so many young people especially are saying, you know, things have to change. We can't continue to do what we're doing. And this is what the revolution is all about. Yeah! But it's a revolution, it's a special revolution. It's a nonviolent intellectual revolution. It's not a brand new idea because it's more or less just a continuation of those ideas that made America great and for some reason, unfortunately, they forgot about a hundred years ago and we need to revive that spirit of liberty once again in this country. have definitely changed recently, especially in the last four or five years, in the last ten years. I've been more or less talking about some of these issues for 30 years, and I notice a big difference, but it's dramatically different in the last five years, because the American people have awakened and found out that we do not have a sound economic policy. And so many now realize that we don't have sound money, and we need to do something about our Federal Reserve System. And the Fed! 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 A wonderful idea! Where did you ever get that idea? Austrian school! Now, the monetary system is very vital. If you want to uh, really understand the cause of liberty, the purpose of liberty, and sound economic policy, you have to deal with monetary policy. But also, something else has happened in the last uh, four to five years. There's been several of us in Washington trying to fight and thwart off the wars that we've gotten involved in and, and have a different type of foreign policy. Not a foreign policy of aggression, not a foreign policy of violence, but a foreign policy that is designed with friendship and trade to all nations willing to trade and be friends of this country. people in Washington that don't quite understand that uh, we uh, are less respected and less liked when we invade countries, bomb countries, occupy countries, tell other people what to do, bribe their dictators. So there's another option. And uh, the American people are hearing about it and they're understanding it. And that is why now 75% of the American people have come to our viewpoint and said, it's time to come home. Get out of Afghanistan. Bring the troops home. So there is a, a definite different attitude with economic policy, the Federal Reserve, and uh, also the foreign policy. But there's also an awakening in this country that there has been a systematic attack on our civil liberties, and we have to stand up and say no more. The purpose of government is to protect our liberty, not to destroy our liberties. For instance, the founders were very proud of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, they wanted privacy. They didn't want the king and the military coming into their homes uh, without permission and without warrants. And yet today, we're living under a law that says that the Fourth Amendment has very little meaning and the president and the executive branch can do just about whatever they want. This is the reason I have talked about before it was passed and since it's been passed, and I believe it should be one of the first things that we repeal once yeah. in office, and that is getting rid of the Patriot Act. these areas, the American people are waking up, whether it has this attack on our personal civil liberties, whether it's our attack on our First Amendment rights, whether it's the understanding of economics, which is uh, coming around to making more sense, as well as the foreign policy. And this is what uh, is dramatically different, and it's dramatically different on the campuses of this country. We're getting thousands of people coming out. I, and if you look for the information about what is happening, guess what? 
the revolution is not being described on TV. <laughs> but the good side of it, we have the internet. Yeah! yeah! The scary part of it is that they know it and they're trying to take the internet away from us and we're not going to let them take the internet from us. Systematically in Washington, D.C., they want to use the Internet to control and understand. They just recently built a huge, the biggest thing in the history of the world, and that is a national security agency uh, compound out in Utah that is, can hold more records than any one establishment before. Trillions and trillions of dollars of, of, of items on all individuals in this country. They don't need that kind of information. They're supposed to do the opposite. They're, we're supposed to have openness in government and privacy for the people, right. not attacking the privacy of the people. Four years ago, five years ago, there were quite a few, mostly the economists that were in the Austrian economic camp were... We're very much aware of the financial bubble and warned about it, and sure enough, it came. Well, the financial bubble comes from the ability of the Fed to monetize debt, which is an encouragement. It's a facilitator. It's a taxer because if governments can spend endlessly for the benefit of buying votes for the, for the individual to stay in office and they never have to worry about paying the bills in the near term, you can tax for a while. You, there's a limit you can tax and you can borrow for a while and then interest rates go up. But then you have this facilitator, this, uh, this instrument of creating new money. Money. And then we had this benefit of us issuing the reserve currency of the world. I trust it because the dollar used to be as good as gold. But the strange thing happened when the gold was removed in 1971, there still remained a fair amount of trust. Now, they're still under the illusion in Washington that the trust will remain forever. But guess what? The trust isn't there anymore, and it's rapidly disappearing. And this is why this recession is different, and it's worldwide. There's a crisis in Europe. They admit now they're going back into recession. And, of course, we haven't solved our problems because we're all facing the same problem. Government has gotten too big. They fight too many wars. They undermine liberties, write too many regulations, and manipulate the economy too much. So the predictable crisis come, and guess what they do in Washington? Congress, the executive branch, the, the uh, Federal Reserve, they say, oh, we're in trouble now, so what we need to do is spend more money, borrow more money, have more regulations, and let the Fed print money endlessly. How can you solve the problem? You cannot solve the problem of too much spending and too big a government by spending more and making the government bigger. You have to do the opposite. Yeah! So next year is going to be an important year. It'll be the anniversary of something that happened in 1913. And uh, that will be the appropriate year on the 100th anniversary of the Federal Reserve. We will repeal the Federal Reserve. Yeah! yeah. Woo! And the Fed! 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 And if we get the country to come around to really understanding what personal liberty is all about, they will realize what Jefferson talked about, that we have Whoa, a God-given right to our life and our liberty, and we ought to have a God-given right to keep the fruits of our labor as well. Yeah. Yeah. Which means the 16th Amendment needs repeal just as well. Yeah. Give the incentive to the people to work and keep what they earn. Believe me, they will work harder. Today, productive energy is not released in this country. If somebody really wants to get productive, how many jobs are going overseas? There's a lot of U.S. companies right now that are adding jobs. But when you look at it, the jobs are being added overseas. So there is so much we can do here to encourage individuals to come back. The tragedy here in this country is if you're on the if you're on the 
uh, receiving and if you if you know the inside track you get the benefits as the bubble is being blown up and then when the crunch comes guess what they get bailed out we need to stop all the bailouts they don't deserve yeah. the bailout. a lot of this is a lot of this has come about mainly because of a misunderstanding of the entitlement system. The entitlements, sounds like an entitlement is a right, but an entitlement isn't a right. You have a right to your life. You have a right to ownership of your life. You have a right to your liberty. You should have the right to the fruits of your labor. But entitlement means that you're entitled to somebody else's life or somebody else's productive effort, somebody else's wealth. No, you, you don't have that. But it's always well intended to say, well, this is only for the poor people, the people falling through the cracks, and they're, they're entitled to own a house. And uh, of course, that led to the housing bubble. And they're entitled to free food and free education on down. But there is no such thing as free stuff. You have to take it from somebody. So it reminds me of my little bumper sticker in Washington, D.C. It says simply, don't steal. The government hates competition. <laughs> but the entitlement system, although it is, has been designed, and many people believe, and, and they're very sincere, and they say, we do care about our fellow man, and we want to make sure that nobody's poor, and we're going to take care of it. But guess what? The entitlement system takes care of the wealthy. It's the Goldman Sachs of the world, it's the banking system, the military industrial complex, the whole mess. They feel entitled, and they throw the crumbs to the poor, and then when there's a crisis, the rich get bailed out, and the poor get poorer, the middle class loses their job, and they end up losing their houses as well. So this is the reason why we have to challenge the whole notion of the entitlement system. You're entitled to your freedoms, and the government should be protecting your liberties, not pretending it can redistribute wealth and create wealth by doing it. It destroys wealth under those conditions. Yeah. So very simply, in order to restore a sound economy and get jobs back here again, I think we should cut spending. But that's, yeah. that's such a strange idea in Washington. Even our side of the aisle has a proposal to look like they're cutting spending, but they're only cutting proposed increases. In the next 10 years, the proposed increases are about $10 trillion. So if they cut them down to 9 or $8 trillion, they say, oh, look, we just cut $2 trillion. I want to cut it. I want to cut a trillion dollars of real money in the first year. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people worry about it and they say, oh, won't that cause a crash in the economy and this will really wreck things? You can't do that. But what about what about saving all this money on the wars? Wouldn't that be a good place to start? Yeah. Yeah. last 10 years, there was $4 trillion added to our debt by fighting these wars overseas. Now, the founders had a good way of restraining us from getting involved in war. They simply wrote in the Constitution that only Congress can declare the war, and which means the Congress is the closest to the people, so the people have a say through their congressmen whether or not we will make this precise de de declaration of going to war. Since World War II, we haven't done it. Since the World War II, we haven't won a war. Since World War II, we've spent trillions of dollars and loss of hundreds of thousands of lives and hundreds of thousands of people injured. And just think of the tragedy of, of the injured that's coming back from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan now. Uh, if you look at what kind of lives that we have lost in the last 10 years since 9-11, Americans, we've, uh, soldiers and con contractors, we've lost 8,500. That's not a fair deal. I understand 9-11 very, very well, but going into a policy where we spend a lot of money, bankrupt ourselves, and a lot of Americans get killed, that's not very good payback. We need to wise up and have a different type of foreign policy. So declaring war on the world by a global war on terrorism, terrorism is a monstrous thing to deal with, but by, by marching around the world believing that we have the moral authority to bomb any country, any place, because there might be a terrorist hiding behind a bush, and having <laughs> secret weapons, and having drone missiles directed from individuals in the United States, and going over, and guess what? We Cowards. make mistakes. 
I mean, do we know that we kill the right people? No. We know that a lot of children and a lot of innocent people die, and we know that every time you kill one over there under those circumstances, you probably create another hundred who are saying, why are we being terrorized by bombs falling out of the sky? We haven't done anything to the earth. So there's every reason in the world why we can cut a lot of money out of the military. We can have priorities. If we continue to do what we're doing, we're going to bring in the destruction of the currency and even the Social Security recipients and the elderly getting medical care and the children's health care and education program, they will come crashing down because when the money doesn't work, nothing works. So we could work our way out of it, but we can't do it by spending more money and printing more money. It won't work, and I think the American people know it, that it can't work. So my idea of cutting a trillion dollars sends a message that we're going to get our house in order. Uh, we can start with overseas spending. We, we don't need to give away foreign aid. I'm, I'm convinced that foreign aid is taking money from poor people in this country and giving it to rich people in poor countries. And it ends up to be a political football, and it doesn't help the people it's supposed to help over there. It helps, uh, helps the government. And uh, besides, if we're a very wealthy country and doing well and setting an example, we as individuals can decide where to send our money and help the people truly in need. And even... Even in the midst of this recession, the American people have been very generous. There's still crises around the world, and the American people come. It's so much better than depending on government bureaucrats and special interests uh, doing these kind of things. So the, we, we can make these cuts. If we do this, the other suggestion I have is going back to the 06 budget. And the government wasn't too small in, in 2006. It was still rather big, so it's not like we're un destroying the whole government. We're just going back to a more modest time and getting rid of a few departments, like, say, five of them to begin with. <laughs> I don't think we need the Department of Energy passing out ethanol benefits to anybody. So there's a lot of things that we could do to, uh, to spend a lot, a lot less, uh, less, less money. And if we did that, we don't have to start. And I think politically, uh, it's a mistake to start on child health care or food for poor people or the elderly health care. Now, those programs theoretically shouldn't have started, and they're not working. If we continue to do this, they're all going to come crashing down. But if we want to work our way out of it, we have to say where we're going to cut, and we should get the people, right, left, center, independents, to agree that coming home and stop spending this money overseas during these wars would be the easiest place. Cut these others and try to preserve these programs and let people get weaned off. For instance, I think it would be just great if we did this and offered everybody that's coming out of college right now and having a tough time, if you wanted to assume responsibility for yourself to stay out of the Social Security system and keep your own money and take care of yourself. Founders were rather clear about the found, uh, about the foreign policy. Their their strong suggestion was that uh, we we have friendship and trade with as many countries as possible, any any that are willing. Now, so often I will be charged, and you will as well, and say, "Oh, you're a bunch of isolationists. You don't want to deal with the world." Oh, yeah, we want to trade with the world. We want to travel. We want to go back and forth. We want to engage, and. The individuals who have the sharpest criticism and call us isolationists are the ones who are the very first ones to put on sanctions on countries trying to start another war. And they're the very same people who won't even entertain the thought that it's time to start talking to the Cubans and travel to Cuba and invest in no more sanctions on Cuba. I think when big, rich countries like ours that have all the military might more than all the other countries to get together, and we intimidate small, little countries, third world countries with sanctions and threats, I think it's a sign of insecurity. We shouldn't be insecure. We have so much strength. But 
we going to ha we will become insecure if we continue to do this because our economy will not sustain us. Big governments and 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 empires and countries that overextend overseas are, are usually never defeated militarily, and we're not going to be defeated militarily. We have the military might, but just think in our lifetime. I mean, the the, the Soviets didn't have to be defeated. When I was in the Air Force in the 60s, believe me. It was a pretty hot, cold war at the time, and we had the missile crisis in Cuba and these other, other things. But the, the way the Soviets were defeated, they defeated themselves, and when they were defeated for economic reason, they collapsed upon themselves. And that is what's happening to this country. The biggest threat is here at home. It's not foreign. It's domestic. But ultimately, the real test is looking at our individual lives and what the government, how the government is controlling us as individuals and what is our personal liberties all about. And this is where I think we're slipping so rapidly away from what was intended. And so many people have been willing to say, well, I, I, know, uh, I know I have to give up some of my freedoms to be safe. And I'd like to suggest... No! No! To suggest you never have to and never should give up any of your liberties for safety. Yeah. And the TSA! But this certainly came up after 9 11 and the rapid passage of, of the uh, Patriot Act. Uh, the uh, congressman I was sitting next to when we were voting on the Patriot Act, uh, he, he was voting for it, and we only had it, had it on the floor about an hour or so. The bill had been around for a long time, in, in one form of another, years, but they couldn't get the consensus to, be, uh, to, uh, to pass it. So after 9-11, the consensus was there, oh, we have to do something, we have to do something. I said, why are you voting for this? You don't even know what's in it. He says, I know. I said, you know, there's going to be some bad stuff in this. He says, yeah, I know that. I said, why are you going to vote for it? He says, well, he says, how am I going to go home and explain to my constituents that I voted against the Patriot Act right after 9-11? I said, why don't you, I said, that is what your job is. Go vote right and go home and explain it to them what you're supposed yeah. to Yeah! But instead, we have continued the process. Not only has it been the Patriot Act, we have the, um, the part of the National Defense Authorization Act. Boom! Where the military now is authorized to arrest American citizens held in secret right, without right. an attorney and indefinitely. So let's put that high on the list for repeal as well. Yeah! Of course, once we get in the repealing mood, uh, we'll repeal that Obamacare as well. Yeah! yeah. government care, what we have to do is get the government out of the way and allowing you to make your own decisions about your medical care. Yes. That is, get the government and the drug companies out of your way for picking alternative health care and nutritional products and vitamins. We want, we want to advance the cause of liberty to such an extreme that we want to return to the times when we were allowed to drink raw milk. Yeah! And, and if a person, if an individual happens to be ill and have heard that growing certain substances in their backyard can help them, <laughs> let them do it. Yeah! Woo! And make sure that under these conditions, both left and right should understand something about states' rights. The federal government has no right to come in and overrule the laws of California yeah. that permit you to do such things. This nanny state uh, legislation we have is based on the assumption that uh, the government can protect you against yourself. The government can't protect us against ourselves, and if it tries, it does it at the expense of liberty. Oh. Boo! 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 Boo!
boo this. President <laughs> Paul! President Paul! Okay. It's okay. <laughs> have to suspend my speech and I'm just getting started. <laughs> Woo! Now, what, what we want people to do is make up their own minds about how they live their lives with one very strict rule. You can't hurt other people. You can't take other people's property. But it's your life. But another basic premise of this is that if you mess up, it's your responsibility and you can't go begging your neighbor or forcing your neighbor to take care of you. But you know, in many ways we accept this. This is very clear, you know, when it comes to some very important issues like uh, our spiritual life. Uh, uh, I'm trying to understand the hereafter. We believe the government has nothing to say about this. So we can pr practice our religion the way we want, the various religions. The government should stay flat out of it. Right. And if a person chooses not to practice a religion, that also should be legal in this country too. <laughs> Bizarre things come out of religious beliefs, sometimes very, very bizarre, dangerous things come out of intellectual beliefs and political beliefs. But we don't outlaw political beliefs. We are still allowed to read them and study them. What, how do we counteract bad political views? With the correct and positive political views. That's how we do it. It that we as a nation have accepted the notion that as soon as it comes to putting something in our bodies or in our lungs, we have accepted the notion that the government has authority over us. Telling us now what to eat and drink and how much salt to have, the whole thing. Why are, what happened to us? Why are we such wimps? Why don't we take our liberty back? Yeah! some who believe that if we don't have government doing this for us, that there will be uh, so much suffering and there will be too many poor people and too many people will use their liberties irrationally and do harm to themselves. But if that, if that would be the, be the case, then you would have to have an army pestering us on a daily basis. And unfortunately, that's what we have. It's called the TSA and the Department of Health. So we need, we need more confidence in ourselves to know that liberty is supposed to be all in one package. Personal liberty, social liberty, is the same as economic liberty. Why should somebody defend the right of the property, ownership, and then declare that you can't smoke or drink certain substances? It's still the same principle. Then there, there are others that say, oh, yes, I defend your right, your freedom of speech, and what you put into your bodies. But, boy, I can't let you spend your own money the way you want. It's one and the same. It got divided up a 100 years ago. We need to put it together by understanding where our liberties come from. From. They don't come from our government. They're ours to be used, and it is ours, and the government is there to be limited to protecting those liberties. A law was passed, passed just recently, and it said that if you happen to be protected by uh, Secret Service, and by the way, I'm not protected by the Secret Service, you know. Yeah! yeah. If, if you are the individuals protected by Secret Service, you're a very, very special person. And if anybody gets within a certain distance of you, 10 or 15 feet, and holds up a sign and demonstrates that you can get 10 years for that. The first thing is, is you're supposed to allow to be able to demonstrate. And people who are, think they're so special, they shouldn't have special rights. Rights should be equal for everybody, not just for special. That, of course, is what's so wonderful about the freedom message is that uh, it should bring us together. If we understand 
what it's all about. It should bring people together because of the issue of freedom. Freedom is what should bring us together, not the way we use our freedom. So if somebody has the freedom to use their money and they waste their money, that should be their problem. It shouldn't be our job to tell them what to do. Same way in a social sense. If people practice certain practices that you don't like and you're annoyed by, just ignore them if they're not forcing you or hurting you. Freedom, and when people have their freedoms and they use them a certain way, it doesn't mean that you endorse what they do. You just endorse the principle of freedom. And that is the reason, that is the reason uh, crowds that come together like this are diverse in the way they think, the way they think about their religion, the way they think about intellectual matters, the way they think about person, personal habits as well. You know, in a truly free society, if you've carried this out, a truly free society would recognize the legal uh, legality of practicing socialism as long as it's voluntary. Anybody who wants to have a social society, and there's been examples of this in our history, if they want to have a collective, fine and dandy. But when there's a collective, when there's dependency and a redistribution of wealth, how often do they come along and say, oh, if a group of you want to live in a truly free society and be exempt from the onerous tax codes and the wars that are happening, they don't allow this to happen. But a free society protects liberty, but it also protects those who want to have voluntary socialism. The freedom movement set, set back, um, you know, 100 years ago or so and all the change in the progressive uh, era. But that test of freedom was really the best test ever. Freedom is a young idea. It's a new idea. It hasn't been practiced for thousands of years. And those who argue, like, like a certain uh, economist argue with me this week that I was going back... <laughs> Truth I was going back a whole hundred years, but the truth is, he was, idea. and they who argue us going back to a hundred years, they who promote tyranny want to go back thousands of years yes. because that's what most of history has been all about. So what we want to do is pick up the pieces intellectually and find out where we went astray and refine it. We don't want to go back to the 19th century gold standard. It was imperfect. We can do better. The understanding of the market is more refined than since uh, Adam Smith. The, the modern day Austrian economists know a lot more about how the market works. And also foreign policy. It's much better understood than certainly it was uh, for these past 50 years and the disaster that it's been bringing to us, the tragedy it has been bringing to us. So that all of these things can be improved upon and move forward. That is what I think is happening. That is why I am so so positive that there is a revolutionary spirit going on in this country and is spreading, and there's no army in the world that can stop the spread of an idea. Yeah! Our time, our time has come, and it won't be stopped. There'll be bumps, it'll be up and downs, and all. We don't know what this week will bring, and next week with the primaries, and next in August. We, we don't know, but I'll tell you one thing. That, on the short range, you might not make the predictions. But on the long range, if we pursue this course and, and we are determined, we will change this country. We will change the concept of liberty, not only in this country, but throughout the world. Yeah! After, uh, after the Vietnam War finally ended in, in the early 70s, after so much tragedy, uh, we had a colonel, uh, Harry Summers, got together with a colonel from Vietnam to sort of clean up the mess, and his name was Colonel Two. And they got together, and our, our colonel, uh, Harry Summers, wanted to make a point, you know, maybe the, the last day of it. He says, well, anyway, colonel, he says, you have to admit, you never defeated us on the battlefield. And Two said, he says, you're right, he says, but it's also irrelevant. <laughs>
It's irrelevant if you lose a battle, but you win the war. So we may lose a battle here and there, but we are going to win the war because we're on the right side of history. We're on the right side of these ideas, and we can win the hearts and minds of people who want to have and live in a free society. Yeah. Also reminds me of the 19s. In the 1960s, there used to be a saying that if you weren't a liberal when you were 20, you didn't have a heart. But if you weren't a conservative by the time you were 40, you didn't have a brain. So I think our philosophy says, why can't you have a heart and a brain together? That's what freedom's all about. But in a revolution, you have to strive for what seems like the impossible and put the energy into it. You have to have passion. You have to use reason. It's not. It's emotion, and, and it is passion, but it also has to make sense. The reason, it has to have reason behind it. Think of the individual behind the revolution, uh, our revolution. It, they said for 100 years they talked and studied and understood what property rights were, and they were well-versed, much more so than so many of us are today. But the revolution, the intellectual revolution that we're talking about has occurred now for several decades. It didn't just pop up four years ago. What's popping up now is the translation of the intellectual movement is popping up in the political atmosphere now. And uh, But for 30 or 40 years, we've had these think tanks, these people writing, and more professors than ever teaching sound economics. So the groundwork has been laid and that is why it's coming about now and we're seeing this. We just don't know the timing. The one thing that we know for certain, if we sit on our hands and we do nothing, there will be the bankruptcy and those people in, I was going to say something else, but I'll call them people. <laughs> those people in Washington who are in charge will not give up their power easily. So this is the reason that is up to all of us. Every one of us has a job to do. One way or the other, everybody's job is made be vary from one to another. Some people will be very involved in uh, politics and campaigning and running for office and teaching and writing and uh, working on the internet. But it is most important that we study and understand so that we can defend it intellectually and not be put down and be told that we don't care about people. Because if we are, have, as we, I believe we all do, have humanitarian instincts, if you have these instincts, there's only one way you can take care of the maximum number of people with the maximum benefits, and that's through a free society. History proves that. If we pursue this with uh, diligence, I believe the uh, results can exceed expectations. I really never expected a whole lot in, in my political career. Matter of fact, I didn't even expect a political career. I just wanted to get a few things off my chest. <laughs> and therefore, I wanted to just lay it out on the table, and I was sort of pessimistic and thinking, well, not any, many people would listen. But I did talk to a lot of people in my congressional district, and they were receptive to these ideas. Now the audiences are bigger and the crowds are more energized, the message is being spread, and this energy that's coming from the younger generation, the incorporation of all age groups now, and with the use of the internet, all this is coming together, and uh, the need is so great. I think the last four years, things have accelerated because of the need. People are sick of the world wars, and they're sick of the spending. They know these debts are horrible, and the students coming out of college, they may have a huge debt and no job, and they know there's something deeply flawed with the system and that we need to change it. Thomas Paine said that the heart of the conflict and the heart of the job is the more glorious is the, is the victory. So it will be difficult and uh, the work will be hard, but if you sort of accept what I'm saying, you cannot be comfortable unless you pursue it. You'll, you'll have to do something because you're in a minority. 
It is never 51% who get up and say, okay, we all understand it now. The founders, the people who orchestrated our, our, uh, our revolution, be some nice. people said it was 3 or 5 or 7%. And yet most people will listen to others who have studied, understood, and influenced other people. So that burden falls on individuals who say, I know there's something wrong, and I think I have it, put it together, and I know what's wrong. It's a great idea. It's an American idea. It's a moral idea. It's a constitutional idea. And that obligations fall on us to do our very best to bring this, this country together because the message of freedom is popular. It brings us all the diverse elements in a, in a society together to strive for this one goal, and that is to live in a free country. Personally, uh, living in a free country means that uh, this is the best opportunity to strive for excellence and virtue. This should be a personal goal for satisfaction's sake. Some people get uh, a lot of satisfaction from different things. But the one thing, though, uh, working hard and taking care of a family and, ha and being prosperous <laughs> is satisfying. But if that is the only goal in life, it doesn't work so well. And I think that is one thing that happened to us in a country is when we were so prosperous and so wealthy, we concentrated on the materialism. We used government to use force to redistribute wealth and supply this, take care of the special interests. And we forgot about where wealth came from. And now, wealth isn't there. The money, the, the money is not sound. The economy is not sound. So once again, if we want to live in a prosperous country, we have to think about where prosperity comes from. And it comes from work. It comes from work and effort and savings. This idea that savings are silly, that liberal economists will tell you, that is silly. Savings is worthwhile working hard and having a product and having a service to give. This is what makes capitalism and free markets work. And it isn't the fact that government redistribu redistributes wealth or think that they can get wealth out of a printing press. It doesn't work. But we're, we're in an age now where there's not a whole lot of confidence in government. And you say, well, isn't that terrible? No, I think it's great. Because, uh, because, you, because if you don't have confidence in the type of government we have now and what we've had, I think that's the, the beginning of wisdom. You, you challenge things. And we still have enough freedoms to challenge. We have enough freedoms to come here. Sometimes I'm not quite sure that the election, elected process is perfect or not, but uh, it's the only thing we have to work with right now. But it does annoy me to no end that when we have a foreign policy that says that what we need to do is promote democracy around the world by force, that we make, like Wilson said, we have to make the world safe for democracy. So we gather up our men and women, we send them overseas, we invade country, we occupy, and we say, you're gonna, we're going to make you have elections like Americans have. We're going to make you <laughs> Democrats and keep voting. So sometimes they ended up actually having elections. Then they elect the wrong people, and we won't accept the election. <laughs> they, and uh, so, uh, but here in this country, it is sometimes very difficult, uh, you know, and, and competing. So that the two-party system is deeply flawed, and having true competition is very, very difficult. People, people now, when they understand this issue, right now the vehicle has to be in the political system. And someday maybe that can be improved. But we still have enough freedom. I think the Internet obviously is very, very important. And being involved, the spreading, of, it's the spreading of ideas. If I had the one thing that is the most important to carry on a revolution is the spreading of ideas. And uh, even in the original days of the founding, they spread ideas by writing letters and pamphlet, pamphleteering. And sometimes they just did it on their own. They didn't uh, have any other vehicle. So the spreading of ideas is key, but acting out afterwards. There are some of my friends who know and understand and think uh, spreading of ideas and intellectually is the only thing that counts in politics don't count. But eventually, spreading of ideas is important, but eventually you have to have political action. The founders 
practice political action. They knew the fundamentals of uh, what tyranny, the bad parts tyranny, and they wanted to change. So they were able to translate that into demanding their freedoms, and that is why we were introduced to uh, a society that we've had. So we have we have been blessed, but if we don't do something, uh, we will lose it. And I think this is what the people are understanding in this country like never before, that we're on the edge of something uh, where, where it's not going to be maintained. The world financial system is worse than anything in my estimation, in our in the history of the world, because it's it's a global econ economy like never before. It's based on a single fiat currency, the dollar, like never before. Debt is uh, unbelievable, and just because we've been taught in school that debts don't matter, and if you have problems with debt, you get more. Try to tell that to a student that's getting out and has debt, and says, "Oh, that's okay. You don't have a job, but you have this debt. You have to run up some more debt. Go get another credit card." We know that doesn't work, and it doesn't work for a country. Either. Either. It doesn't work for the entire world either. Some people think the solution is only dealing uh, with waste, fraud, and abuse. And that's sort of a pet peeve. If there's a vote on the House floor of oh cutting God. back waste and fraud, uh, of course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for it. But that isn't the problem. Government by nature is wasteful and fraudulent and abusive. Yeah! yeah.